uh hi everybody hi amani hi francis uh we are beginning i think the the first women in health uh, webinar of the network uh, today and i am really happy that uh, we have many panelists so that's why we decided decided to have a conversation and not our usual powerpoint presentations so i would like you to just start with an introduction of yourself and how long you have been with the network and then we would take up each question so amani could you start please oh hello kamani thank you uh, i'm amani refat uh, i'm a professor of uh, public health in uh, suez canal university i'm professor emeritus and in the same time i'm a core faculty uh, online faculty with walden university uh, usa um, uh, I joined uh, uh, the, or I, my first in, uh, acquaintance with the network activity were in uh, uh, 85. <laughs> I was just junior faculty in uh, Suez Canal University, Faculty of Medicine. And as you know, Suez Canal University was one of the founders of the network at that time, um, the dean and vice dean. So uh, we hosted the, uh, the network conference uh, at that time, 85, in, our, in the Suez Canal University at Ismailia City. Um, and at that time, um, I started to know about the network activity. I joined, and because I was studying my Master of Health Professional Education at that time, I started to participate in the conferences. Uh, and uh, first, uh, 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 I met Nigat, uh, Judy, and others, uh, uh, and uh, God bless her soul, Rugaya, in uh, one of the conferences. It was in 1891, uh, where we thought about the idea of women health. Uh, group. The women health task force, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we started at that time the women health group. Uh, uh, by that time, I joined the Women Health Group. Since okay, then. thanks, Amani. Uh, yeah. Francis, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm um, Francis Hughes. I'm a uh, registered nurse, and I have only recently joined the network. I have a strong history of working in nursing, and particularly in mental health and with vulnerable populations um, through New Zealand, Pacific, and Australia. I have a, a visiting professor uh, role at the University of Sydney, and I am a, also a senior fellow at the um, Centre of Health and Patient Outcomes at the University of Pennsylvania, and an adjunct position at Queensland University of Technology. My interest um, is the fact that um, I have worked predominantly in nursing and with vulnerable populations, and we are a very large female profession, and we have constantly been under the um, parameters of of a gender and um, feminist processes. We, um, in my regards to the work that I have done, I have work predominantly with big organisations over the last few years and particularly involved with UN agencies in regards to the social determinants of health and particularly trying to influence um, SDG 5, which is part of the SDGs, which really we should be doing a great deal more of. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francis. Well, well, it's really great to know our esteemed panelists now. Uh, yeah, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kamaini from India. Uh, I'm uh, basically an uh, activist and a lawyer working on public health issue with the special emphasis on uh, issues of women's rights and violence against women. And I've also been associated to the Women Health uh, Task Force in the network for almost a decade. So shall we start with our uh, first question today that how do we make community approaches for women's health effective in a collaborative setup of academic institutions, government and NGOs which are working in the field? Because as an activist, I've always felt that, you know, there is a gap between 
the researches and the academic activity which happens in the academic institution and universities and at the field where actually the research is finally taken you know uh, to implement the various theories so i would like to know from you and your experience that what how can we make these approaches wherein the researchers and the activists together could work for the betterment of women's health amani yeah i think this is uh, our role as academics uh, that we don't uh, keep ourselves within the walls of our university so um, from my personal experience i always worked with ngos uh, either national here in egypt or international um, i take any chance to uh, hear and i outreach for the ngos in egypt so i will start to dialogue and work with them and that succeeded not only with me but with my colleagues i communicated with my colleagues to let us work with people when we uh, 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 thought about surveying the uh, uh, magnitude of violence against women in ismailia city in, in in egypt we didn't work alone as professionals as uh, uh, academia we went to an ngo um, we have a lot yeah, of Amani, uh, Amani have worked on the issue of FGM, female genital mutilation. Could you also yeah. talk about that? Yeah. yeah we, I worked on female genital mutilation and violence against women. I worked yeah. on both. Yeah, because they are both uh, two sides of the same problem, in, in, which is uh, in, uh, 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 violence. It's FGM is, is the severe type of violence against, because it is the severe type of violence against the female child, not only yeah. the woman. Yeah, because if we, when they do it to the child, she, she, she tailors her attitude and she starts to feel that she's incomplete, that she is uh, not free with her body, that she is uh, belonging to others, not uh, uh, empowered. Uh, so usually this is tailoring the behavior and this is the aim of the practice uh, 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 by the community is to reduce the uh, uh, sexuality of the girl but not only that but to uh, act, behave her in a certain way to be yeah. uh, submissive and to so it is a kind of uh, uh, so i would say that universities cannot work cannot work alone uh, uh, do academia and do research that will be put on the shelves uh or read only and discussed by other academia that's good but the better is to work with community in each community in each country we have a lot of ngos for women uh, even simple empowering women about economic development uh, projects uh, uh, training them so we can introduce ourselves with them to use them and to help them and and learn from them how to reach okay. the community how to sit with the people we are because we are all uh from the same community uh if we are uh more educated that's to use it to empower the community around us i'm gonna pick up on the academic issue um yeah. and i think one of the issues is that we are now recognizing is that the evidence that shows that women to be vastly underrepresented in author review editorial positions across scientific and medical journals and this is a whole area which i think we haven't really understood well so if we want the evidence and the um, want the examples we want to have the, the stories both uh, and data from quantitative and qualitative um, research mm -hmm. We need to be able to understand that the, even though we have a vastly female-dominated workforce, we have a vastly male-dominated set of peer reviewers. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And we're poorly presented in, in regards to women. And we seem to um, have a ceiling of roughly around 30% of female authorship. If we don't have mm. poor representation if we have poor representation, then that leads mm -hmm. to poor participants as peer reviewers, fewer publications, less funding and less awards. So I think this is an issue which we need to tackle 
with the scientific um, publishers and journals and get more peer reviewers. We need to get more ability to start pushing for why there is um, such a, a, a domination of males on, on peer reviewers. And the latest Lancet um, mm -hmm. in February 5th to 15th of this year has got an amazing commentary on this area. But I think for academia, we really need to push this really hard because we are just not getting the amount of female authorship. And a lot of that has got to do with a, a semi-glass ceiling that exists around 30%. Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with you. And in fact, I attended one of the CUGH, uh, you know, conferences two years back, and they were having a panel of the half the women hold the sky and they were talking about women's health. But sadly, there was not a single woman in that panel. And, you know, one al always wonders that even within the NGOs and the nonprofit sector and even mm -hmm. the government, you know, uh, uh, various forums, where are the women, actually? When well, we are talking about women's health issues, the whole issue of women being partic participating in their own problems, I think it's a, it's a global phenomena. We are joined yes. by Nigat now. Nigat, can you hear me? Yes, can. Can you hear me? yes, can yes. You Nigat, could you, could you could you please introduce yourself? We are on the first question only. Can you just introduce okay. and just talk about the first question of how we can make the community approaches to women's health in a col collaborative setup? Okay, um, I'm Nigat Huda, and I have been with the network uh, since 1991. And I think uh, the task force, the Women and Health Task Force, was launched in that very year when. Uh, when myself and a few of us decided to have this task force. So my association with the network and on women's and health is immense uh, due to this. Um, mm. And in order to continue with what we were told, I mean, I, 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 sorry, I sort of joined you late, but the, what we did, I think my experience has been very rich with the network and the women and health task force. And we sort of um, got together and kind of a collaborative partnership uh, with the universities, uh, those who attended um, the network conference, and then those women who were engaged, it could be faculty members or maybe students joined later on. But, you know, those who were interested in women health issues and were engaged in community-based activities and programs, they sort of, uh, we all got together and this was really um, an immense experience because then uh, with the network, we have been going on with this task force, but it was in 2003 that uh, gets another an NGO, Global Health Through Education Training and Service, that sort of provided us uh, financial support and that is where we took a really, uh, what should I say, uh, an immense uh, success stories started to begin. Because that's where we gave out uh, mini grants. Uh, we selected institutions that sort of, um, you know, had really promoting women's health at community-based level. So we had immense number of about, and the mini grant was not of about thousands of dollars, but it ranged from somewhere. I mean, the maximum I recall is five thousand dollars, and in five thousand dollars, we managed to give, um, you know, maybe sometimes to two recipients and sometimes to three and it was interesting that the level of work was at the community level and all the um, you know uh, training of uh, I remember that from Nigeria we had Nigeria we had mini grants given to India uh, we had uh, Uganda Sudan Sudan worked on uh, internal displaced person refugee camps promoting women's health informing them about uh, HIV, AIDS, how to raise awareness. And then it was it was a very huge list that I have. It's on adolescent health. So I think the list is, goes long, and it's not only in one country, but community-based. It was university partnership within an NGO partnership. It could be there were some programs that were also a government was involved as well. So I think uh, these are the areas that we really could do and we worked and we showed uh, I think through our project that how we can work and promote women's health with even with a small grant it didn't have to be but it was at community-based level and um, 
it involves and uh, also in these uh, mini grants <laughs> we had a lot of students the involvement of students yes. in these mini grant was also very good no yes and then we had modules so i think we did a lot of work there are a lot of the third edition of our module is due and then again contributors has been our task force member and now eventually mm-hmm. we have grown into you know then we gone into new heights and now we are now uh, an independent organization as well working as you know working towards that so we are uh, incorporated in south africa cape town so i think uh, this is these are success stories that we can work and uplift women we can identify uh their uh, issues related to health related maybe to education but to their own you know awareness of their rights they were gen- you know they were immense i mean i have a sir, long list of, even from family planning they were about women traditional he- healers in nigeria godwin had with church based and even hester had some you know with church based groups so i think this is uh, this just shows how you can do it with a collaboration with university ngos and and it's just as a will to do it i think willingness on our part and willingness on those who are you know who are really concerned for women's health yeah i i think this was a, actually it is like a best practice of including academic institution government and even the activists and all coming together uh, you know involving community approaches to women's health uh i i we are as we still wait for i think khalifa and kennedy but we will go to a second question that how do we address the ethical cultural and local mm-hmm. challenges in the community based on the participatory research uh, so you see what in my personal experience in india when we are doing research you know uh, especially in the urban areas or we, we call those settlements where poor people poor people live sometimes one feels that we are using the community as a lab we as in the academic or the research or even the ngos are the, the people who feel that so uh, you know how how do we overcome that uh, challenges amani what has been your yeah. experience uh, uh well from our experience um when i worked with the students and other faculty we to empower community towards women health issues we didn't work alone we didn't go to the community and imposing them imposing on them uh, our topic we started dialogue with the community we uh, even they initiated we heard about what they want uh, it needs long time uh, 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 exchange of uh, mm. of trust Uh, because gaining trust of the community it needs time because the, the, the i agree with you sometimes other uh, researchers use them so they have to get trust in you that you are not using them you are part of them and you have to have real partnership with them uh, listen to them have their trust yeah and uh, even when let them uh, Uh, when we worked in uh, community partnership i trained community health workers towards uh, empowering women in maternal and child health because they asked for that they asked for that uh, i didn't go and t- tell them well this is your problem no they they we sat with them and discussed what are your problems we can discuss with them and then we are not using them we want yeah. to help them uh to solve their problem but we are researchers so we will have our science we have the knowledge to help them and they have the power they have the uh, uh needs uh, uh, so we can collaborate with them i will say one of many grants that i took about uh from the uh, uh, uh women and health group because i'm a member in from the start was how to introduce our students to different women health group the modules i used it with the students so the uh, for the female genital cutting for example we started to have some sort of webinar uh, 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 um, seminars with the community going to ngos however we didn't go for that uh, particular because this is a sensitive issue when we are invited to talk about different health problems and for an ngo 
I started to talk about uh, responding to their question. And then from the talk, I started to discuss the female genital cutting. What about it? And the students were there. They were responding also to questions because students are still, uh, they are uh, 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 part of the community. They are not professional yet. So they gained the trust from the community. So uh, we started to discuss it and responding to questions from the uh, uh, attendants and participants of this uh, 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 seminar with the, with the community. So yeah. when you introduce something, you don't go and impose it. But you yeah. can, within the, uh, uh, the dialogue and responding to community health questions and their needs, their priorities, they have to have yeah. their priorities. Yeah, so building trust and the priorities from the community is yeah. very important. Francis, what do, you, uh, what do you have to say through your experience? Um, well, I think it's really important that whatever research is done with and for women is co-designed. I think the important, other important issue is that we must not promulgate practices that um, promote gender inequality. So gender equality um, must be actively addressed in the lens of the methodology and methods we are using for research. And I think that's something that's still missing. I also think that the issue of ownership of data so the, the co-design period is very important that um, if we are uh, working with communities predominantly women that they are, do have ownership they are part of it they are going to benefit from it there is it's not just about us um, um, as researchers coming in and um, using them as as was mentioned before as kind of um, a lab rat so that people observe, make observations, collect data and then never come back. So I think there's got to be greater ownership. That means we have different structures of how we set up the research and mm -hmm. also how we then disseminate and the, and the data is controlled. This I think is fundamental to um, changing the really way in the future of how communities to not um, create more gender inequality. Thanks, thanks, Francis. Yeah, I, I truly think think that. In my, one of my experiences was, you know, I'm I'm attached with people's health movement, and we have been looking at the cases of medical negligence and you know human rights violation within the within the health system. So we did a sort of a public hearing uh, with the Human Rights Institute, but then when the people came with the complaints, the expectation is would we get justice there at that time raising their hopes i mean i myself felt that you know coming to a public hearing where the government officials are going to listen to you will you get justice there and then no i don't think so but we have at least highlighted mm -hmm. highlighted the fact that there was a medical negligence and the governments were accepting the fact but when when the expectations of the community are high and i think it is very important to lay out the reality uh, to our, uh, you know, to the community as well, because there is a lot of hope attached to it. Uh, Nigat, oh, what do you I have to add on? No, I just, I mean, there are several ethical issues also. So I think when you are doing this research, there could be some, you know, of course they are, they are co-partners and they have to be actively involved in such kind of research. But, uh, you know, I think we, we sort of overlook the ethical issues that may arise. You know, sometimes when you're doing research, there could be some negative, uh, you know, things, uh, uh, you know, about the community that may be revealed during research. So then how do you address those issues? How do you, I mean, you know, and then how do you get your university to sort of be part of this? Because not many universities are doing this kind of research, at least in our part of the world. So that means they are also not very clear about how these ethical challenges have to be addressed. So I think when we are doing this research, when the community is involved, it's participatory. We have to be aware and very sure about the ethical challenges that arise in doing, undergoing this research. 
when we work either in research or in discussion with the community, we don't mm. work with women only. We yeah. need to work with men too. Yeah. The, uh, because uh, uh, in, in different cultures, like m my country culture, um, men are uh, taking decisions. So if we want to raise awareness or to discuss violence, um, uh, we have to discuss it with the presence of men in, in general, not only the women. Uh, yeah. Because we need to, aware, uh, to raise their awareness that uh, manhood doesn't mean that you would be aggressive or violent. So, um, of course, we, in some research, we need to separate because of the sensitive questions. But when we yeah. start to work uh, 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 for women empowerment or raising awareness, we don't need to work with women only, but with men. Yeah. Um. How can we ensure the government policy makers adopt and mainstream the best practices with a gender sensitive lens? Um, well, I think the important thing is that they have they are involved in mm. education that there is a responsibility I think for anybody in office and regional um, local and national governments to have training so that their public servants and those policy makers have analytical training and understanding around gender. This is really important because it's the lens that they use that they, they view problems um, and seek evidence differently if they have um, training and education. And I know with the government departments that I've worked in, we um, all, all the staff had to undertake analytical training in understanding uh, gender as a gender framework, just like they had to do for other other um, areas. So I think that the key thing is that there is exposure. You can't expect policymakers to understand what this is. Mm. They will just see it as a female issue, and this is not a female mm. issue. We know that yeah. if they do not have good education and understanding gender, that gender inequality is transformed into health risk through discriminatory values, norms, beliefs, and different exposures. So it's really important, my thing, is that you get to the root, which is they're exposing those um, governments and offering mm -hmm. programs. Universities can offer programs to these organisations to do workshops on um, gen um, gender frameworks for analysis. And I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nigat? I think we are correctly star policy makers. I mean, they really need training. It's a, it's about mindset. It's not so much of training. Regardless of how much you train them, how do you change their mindset? Whether they are policy makers or, or not, you know, just the ordinary man on the street, you find that they have this part to, uh, you know, mindset. And that is, I think, that becomes an issue. So they... Uh, you know, within the government or within the policy makers or uh, they become, I mean, I think the whole group becomes divided. Few will be supporting that, yes, there should be legislation on these issues and they would be supporting. But the others will become very resistant to that. So I think it's with mindset that we continue to have issues as far as enough, you know, my, my part of the world. So I think... Uh, how do you change the mindset? You can work, yes, training, awareness, uh, and somebody should take the lead. And uh, you know, it's not one or two, but then there should be somehow to persuade them to think of the Yeah. Okay, we have our another panelist. Ken has joined us. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry for later the experiencing some technical technical problems with yeah. uh, my internet signal. My name is Kennedy Omondi Ogutu. I'm a recent graduate nurse uh, from Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, Nairobi, Kenya. I am passionate about community empowerment and social accountability to communities as far as their health are concerned. I'm the current African Regional Representative of the Network Organization under uh, the South under the, the network to us unity for health. I'm also an alumnus of the Global Exchange in Medicine and Exchange Program. And 
regional vaccine program at the University of Zimbabwe attached at Parvenya to a group of hospitals. I was an award winner of the STEM Project for Health competition 2018 by, by Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research AIMA after initiating a community project on eradication of Jesus in the rural communities of Kenya, and I am. The project was entitled Help Remove My Jika, and I was privileged to attend and present the project at the Network Profit Health Conference in Limerick, Ireland. I have done a lot of incredible work in promotion of health and prevention of illness, especially in maternal mm -hmm. child well-being, and, and I've been a long-term volunteer of the Beyond Zero Campaign Initiative, which, which is aimed at promoting maternal and child well-being and, and reducing child and maternal mortality rate. Okay, so uh, uh, what have been your uh, community approaches uh, in, in your area? And uh, did you also have, uh, you know, when you talk about child and maternal health, mm -hmm. any issues of gender violence and looking at violence and against women also? Yes. Uh, basically, my volunteering part in the Beyond Zero Company initiative, mostly we are dealing with issues, health issues or concerns that are mainly affecting the, the women. And for this case, we were trying to address various issues like maternal child death. We have been able also to tackle or address issues like the obstetrical system among women and also gender-based violence. For this case, female genital mutilation, which is very common in very many communities of Kenya. So through the initiative project, we have been able to address the issue. Okay, so w w what are the ethical and cultural challenges you have faced uh, faced in your uh, community-based participatory research projects? Um, regarding the challenges you are facing in community, if you look at the literacy level of most people in Kenya, especially those who are advanced in age, the literacy level is very high. So even if we are getting to commit to train these people about uh, safety practices in the community uh, that will not uh, have negative impacts on their, on, their, on their health, but they are more into culture. So apart from training them and, and telling them or sharing with them information about the negative impacts of such cultural practices like FGM uh, that lead to threatening of the life of, of mothers during childbirth, they still, on go, they still go on practicing them because they feel their cultural heritage is being uh, interfered with. So those are some of the challenges. At the same time, the men are promoting such culture. So mm -hmm. uh, children, especially the, the young girls, will run away from home, but they are being forced uh, to get uh, uh, circumstances for, the, for this case of gender undergo female genital mutilation so that they can be incorporated into, into the society. So those are some of the challenges. Despite various measures and policies that the government has come up with in eradicating female genital mutilation, we are still having a, a good percentage of members or people in the community who are not uh, willing to, to change their practices. Yeah, this is very interesting. We have two panelists here who have been working on the issue of uh, female genital mutilation. And I would like to add that you will be surprised to know that even in India mm. and actually in Bombay, in Bora, Muslims, uh, uh, we have come to know that there is uh, female genital cutting happening. And in fact, just a few days back, there has been a first case wherein one of the persons have been uh, given punishment because here the the women group are asking to you know add fgc also in the issue of violence against women and also come up with a new law but people are very surprised that india being the largest democracy and being you know we are talking about all those rights and everything but still these things are going on in india as well so we come to our uh, last question that how can we coordinate our efforts across borders and establish a way to learn from each other through best practice practices? Uh, Francis, I will I will ask you to just go ahead with this. Well, I, I think that, that what we're doing now is networking. You, you can't 
networking, sharing, collaborative efforts across borders, doing um, cross-country research. Yeah. Also, that level, and then the bigger level was influencing governments, mm. I suppose, and I've been involved in doing a lot of that um, through some of my NGO work and my government work, is getting information and briefings to governments when they go to committees, um, UN um, meetings, Commonwealth meetings, WHA mm. meetings, all those kind of areas. I think they can't you just keep keep networking and sharing, and of course doing um, as much publications jointly with a lot of collaborators. I think it's really important to get the evidence up there. Amani. Yeah, uh, I agree that what we are doing as a group of women and health task force and as the, uh, in the, we are now as an organization, this sort of collaboration between different countries, we have all uh, sharing the same interest. And in, in the same time, each one of us is in working in different country and she can network with uh, 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 colleagues. Um, uh, national uh, 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 people uh, and uh, reach for a uh, policy maker in her community or whatever, um, not only in the education institution. So we are spreading and networking uh, and we are exchanging experience. Like today, we are working with and talking to different participants from all over the countries. So we are crossing the borders now. There is no borders in uh, facing the we will find that we are facing the same issues and same problem like violence against women, female genital cutting, which is, uh, in, in spite of that it is mainly in Africa, uh, in, in, in the middle of African countries, and some of the Middle Eastern, as you mentioned, that it spread for different countries, and even you, in USA or, or, or Europe, mm -hmm. there are cases. And so uh, unless we work together and learn from each other and exchange experience, we will uh, be able to address the local health problems and we can uh, uh, endorse uh, new strategies through learning from each other and from exchanging experience. Yeah, yeah. Nigat? It's the networking, collaborative work that matters the most. And now we are in a very good position that we have people, that we have, uh, you know, individuals from different countries who have the experience of their countries. They share, they have shared their experiences and in, in, in every meeting we learn something new from them. And I think this is how we can, uh, you know, find out more about and how we can collaborate and have some research, joint research projects and continue to do that, that will be will, will improve the health of women globally. I mean, I think we, we need to have a more collaborative approach and we need to emphasize that women's health is important unless we collaborate and we work together and on issues that are important to most of us. Okay. Ken, can we have the last word from you? Regarding one way we can do is through benchmarking with other countries which have set quality standards in women in promoting women's mm -hmm. health. And uh, those countries which are facing challenges, especially in matters of of maybe practices that are that are endangering women's health, we can use that opportunity to uh, by going beyond the borders to benchmark with countries which are doing very well in promoting women's health. So we can be able to learn from them. Then too is coming up or establishing interregional policies and that promote and empower women's health. In this case, when you are having, let's say, three or, uh, three, three or more countries coming together to develop policies uh, that uh, are geared towards solving challenges, especially for the women's health, this one will actually promote women's health and we shall be able to solve such challenges in the community. Then my third uh, uh, point is about creation of uh, interactional platforms. Let's say for this, this case, we can be having regional conferences where various countries involving various uh, different philanthropies come together, uh, geared towards empowering women's health. So in this case, we can be able to share experiences from different countries 
in this regional conference that uh, mm -hmm. we have organized. At the same time, you can be able to come up with solutions that we can be able to solve the problems women are facing uh, in our various communities and countries. And for this case, we know the various uh, challenges uh, that women are facing that they need to be addressed. So through such interactional platforms, we are able to find solutions and be able to implement these solutions that we come up with through sharing of our ideas. Thank you. Meanwhile, I think that, uh, you know, this webinar, one uh, output, in fact, a very uh, actionable output could be mm -hmm. if we could have a collaborative uh, research, actually, thinking. Uh, we are joining in from different parts of the world. And as we said, that the um, interregional or, uh, you know, uh, multi-country study, if we can have finding on the issue uh, of women's health, um, it would be interesting. Yeah. And we also have uh, SA students with us. So I think we have the whole uh, uh, sort of a battalion to work with as well. And it would be interesting if as an output of this webinar, we can, we should actually come together to have, a, you know, uh, inter-country research. I mean, we can think of the to topic and the the commonality here. I have FGM, or we can see violence against women as a women's, uh, you know, health issue. Also, looking at uh, gender discrimination, as Francisca, uh, you know, talked about uh, earlier. That mm -hmm. is, even within the scientific committees, you know, we don't have women. We don't have women in the empowered positions required. So actually, we don't have women at the policy holding position, which actually make a difference. Now, when we are talking about the government policies and making difference, until or unless they're not going to be gender sensitive, it, I mean, it's it has been impossible. And as we have seen, you know, uh, that there has not been much changes for women's health, actually. It's only when there is an international pressure. I mean, Francisca was talking about SDG 5 and, you know, how now the sustainable development goals we have to the whole agenda of 2030 is there. You know, how our country is faring and all that. And that could be another framework if we are thinking about it. I don't know what you people think about. Thank you, uh, Sari Kamani. I just want to say if we want to look at the bigger picture, I think there are two, three important things that we need to uh, educate the next generation of our health workforce and this could include our uh, you know um, physicians and nurses and other health workers on women's issues we need to sensitize them on these issues right now we are not doing this as much as we should do I mean you know I can say at least uh, I think even in India and Pakistan we look mm -hmm. as a medical problem if somebody gets beaten up and yeah. goes into the emergency mm -hmm. It's a medical issue. It's not something, you know, then she's treated on those lines. You know, if she has got injuries, she's designed to the surgery, gyne ops and things like that. So it's, uh, I think, uh, what the change of mindset is required. We need to think in terms of women's health, what is required. And we need to think in terms of collaborative practice. If a woman walks in with such issues, where, you know, there should be a team who should be engaged with her and should come to help her out and should sort of lead her to the right resources. So I think a lot of work is required. It's just, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Another topic, as you have suggested, you know, sensitization, gender sensitization of the medical professionals or the doctors or the nurses. You know, this is this is a, because I do feel patriarchy mm -hmm. overall, whether you are a developed country or you're underdeveloped or developing is very much in there still a fight for patriarchy is still there at, at various different levels maybe in usa it is different in south asia india pakistan we are having different struggles but the gender discrimination underlining is there so that that could be a uh, uh, another approach to it any other ideas i just wanted to add to your idea of activating networks and i would love for amani who's probably going next to say how would you activate this one idea that we've been playing with is 
you know, to host challenges that are is really a cross sectional of team members on maybe a regional level or a very local level, where you may have the females, the women and the men coming together to collectively design and kind of put out what their solutions may be. So I was really curious about how it might work in Africa or versus Pakistan or France is on board and she's really been talking about blockchain technology and using that as a tool. Or Imani is like, does it work differently in different communities? Because ultimately, as we really want to activate um, groups to find these solutions, it's one thing to have a webinar. It's another thing to get people to activate and move forward. Nice. So I'd love to just expand upon your question as, as, as you go for this last round. Well, I would say that uh, uh, I would comment on Nigat about introducing the, uh, uh, the topic from start. And uh, this is the, the issue about uh, 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 the gender issues. You start from the beginning, from the uh, undergraduate medical students or nursing. Or, so um, in response to Nick's question, um, I think we are doing very good uh, 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 job by uh, doing similar webinars and a series of collaboration. I think that we should come together, um, male and female network, against population issues and and address the gender inequality because gender inequality is transformed into health risk. And what we need to know is why is that happening and how is it happening and what can we do about it. So there's not one health risk that does not have it play out with gender inequality. And I think the fact that over the last several years, gender was, has become less and less of an issue in regards to global health is really shocking. We, we need to address the fact that MDGs were, you know, had, had a much stronger ability to address this. The current um, DGs yeah. and SDG 5 needs to be absolutely strengthened. So I think we've got to get to that hub. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I do agree with you that, uh, you know, MDG were much stronger addressing this issue. Ken, what do you think with the students, with the SNO? I mean, would, would it be possible for having a sort of mapping of uh, within medical schools, how the gender sensitive curricula is or something like that? Can we have a sort of a secondary research of mapping across medical schools? Um, well, for me, I think institutions of higher learning should be able to uh, adjust or come up with curriculum and also programs that uh, try to, to solve or to meet the health needs of the community. Let's say for this case, we are dealing with issues about gender-based violence. We realize like in Africa, most communities do practice female genital manipulation. So, how the institutions of higher learning uh, help to solve these problems in the community? I think they should be able to, co to incorporate programs that are trying to, to meet the health needs of these communities. When you have so when you have institutions, medical schools, nursing schools producing um, uh, graduate, graduates, uh, medical graduates who are able to to use the knowledge they acquired from school to implement in the society, I think it will play a very key role in trying to to solve or reduce the impact of these uh, practices to women's health. At the same time, um, we should also institutions should be able to to come up with um, with awareness creation through formation of club and uh, so the formation of associations and organizations that are geared towards empowering women health through this we're able to sensitize the community uh, by conducting community uh, outreach programs that are conducted with students together with with the faculty staff and also the well wish of the volunteers who who are passionate about empowering women and health so for me, I think institutions should be able to adjust their curriculum and programs they're offering so that it can be able to meet the community needs. 
Thank you. At least in my country, it's the media that plays a very you know important role. So I think we do need to sort of activate. They are already very much active already, but then on gender issues, how to deal those issues, how to report those issues, and how to come up with solutions. So I think they need a lot of education because uh, the population sort of seems to be a lot, of, you know, hooked onto the, the the television or you know other reporting uh, channels. So I think that. that also has to be taken into consideration because if if you want to change mindsets if you want to improve the level of the health of the community we have to come up with better success stories we have to educate people and i think one of the important way of the uh, you know getting it to broaden our horizon and you know involving people that really can make an impact so that i think we need to broaden our group and we need to involve others as well who have an influence what we can do as individual to ensure that women are incorporated in matters mm-hmm. pertaining to healthcare or oh, this is very interesting question yeah um i believe uh, 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 what do you mean by in, uh, uh, do as individuals we are university professors or we are researchers so we have different roles uh, to ensure that women could be incorporated um some of us may be a policy maker i'm not i'm a university professor and a researcher um to incorporate women in 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 health matter or healthcare i have to listen to them um uh, because i have to work with them and that takes long time it is not uh, just a few uh, visits uh, or that. and it lo- it needs long long battle or fight with uh bureaucracy sometimes uh and cultural attitude uh, because again it's and resistant to change but it happens change happens i will give you one example um uh, about fgm uh, how can we change the community and because our medical students are part of the community um i was giving uh, each year a lecture or about in the women health about the uh, consequences of fgc um, on the health of students each year i find the students uh, usually a male student again it's me and discussing with me this is required by religion and i started to to enter the dialogue every year i had that but i remember one student after uh, the lecture came to me with booklet that he is using to educate the community uh, uh, about uh, uh, <coughs> the benefits of fgm i told him don't get me a booklet you are educator you are uh, you will be a physician in some days mm-hmm. so don't use this one get me a textbook get me a reference get me a citation about them this uh, 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 he is now a graduate and he is the uh, he is one of the advocate of fighting fgm so change can happen and he is working because he's a gynecologist now he told me he's in every woman he work with and he told he's telling her don't do that for your daughter it is too late for the women now but don't do it for your daughter so change can happen so if you are starting as educator from your role as educator and as a researcher to reach out for the future uh, the change can happen and you can involve women in that after that um i'd just like to make a comment i think it's important that um individuals we put ourselves forward to be at various levels in our healthcare system we also need to support other women to go for positions we need to also um alert um organizations where there seems to be percentage disparities like uh, people on boards um where there's predominantly males um in our healthcare system universities and the senates those um and and in politicians so i think there's multiple levels as individuals that we can support we can put ourselves forwards but we also can alert and we need to write and speak out when things aren't right 
That's right. I agree with you. I think this is our responsibility to the society, to the women at large, that we are in a position. We are in position that we should need, uh, you know, continue supporting women and women becoming leaders in their own profession and their own rights wherever they are. So it's our responsibility. I look at it as our response, my responsibility. Okay. So if we don't have any other questions or comments, I think uh, uh, I would like to end this uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kamali, for moderating. Thank you.